Yourself. It's perfect. Now, there's a fault. Well, nothing shows up on the checks, nothing. Comes and goes. Ever since we left out for one. What comes and goes? Power. Fluctuations at irregular intervals. Well, which unit? Any of them. All of them. All right. Make a full power check, every unit. Aye, aye, Captain. Have to shut down the drive, though. Then we shut down. I'll give them their first sail drill while you're checking. Yeah, they'll like that. How much longer? I suppose she'll come when she's ready. <sighs> she treats us like nobodies. She's the best solar yacht captain in the galaxy. To her, you're a nobody. A nobody with money. Well, and style, darling. And style. <laughs> we bought this ship. We paid for the conversion to a solar yacht. We pay all the racing expenses. All useless without Lisa. If it wasn't for us, she wouldn't be able to race, let alone win. I just don't see what gives her the right to treat us as she does. Oh, that's not fair, Zarel. She's always polite. Oh, on the surface, maybe. <laughs> We're a necessary evil. But you can see she despises us. She earned her reputation. Look, I built up my design business till it covers three planets. And the kids back home have raided their grandmother's wardrobes and made the name of Zarel fashionable again. Almost. <laughs> Well, darling, looking at you, I can see that your little planet needs all the help it can get. I hear it's your sister who has the real genius. She's a designer. I'm the businesswoman. Without me, she'd be nothing. You inherited your business. You see, the trick is to start from nothing. How did you make your money, Kurt? Hmm, bit of this, bit of that. And the early days? One hears such interesting rumours. Smuggling, 
Space piracy? <laughs> Me? Well, I expect to inherit half a planet from my dear father. And Mari here is a planetary president's daughter. And far too beautiful even to think about work. <laughs> <laughs> is in visual scanning range, Commander. According to our sensors, they've cut their power. Ah. Convenient. Select a boarding party and prepare an assault craft. At once, Commander. This one looks promising. Tell the Admiral I shall deal with it myself. designed her a uniform jacket and what happens half the time she doesn't even wear it fancy jackets don't win races the fact remains that our money however acquired bought this ship oh, shut we up. should be giving the orders not taking them Lisa Duran may be the captain but she's our employee uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting there's a problem with the power drive major very minor. Rogar's dealing with it now, but we can't go on till it's fixed. Why not? Why can't we just use the solar sails? After all, that's the whole point of this cruise. Solar sails are very fragile. The thing they do best is break down. So if we lose power and sail, we'll just drift. So? Food supplies are limited. We'd end up eating each other. <laughs> well, I'd start on you. <laughs> <laughs> so what now, then? More waiting? Solar sail drill. Sail deck in ten minutes, please. Um, working dress. Remember this, it's important. In solar yacht racing, the start is everything. Whether we win or we lose can all be decided in those first few minutes. controls one bank of sails. Each of you must obey my orders instantly and accurately. Understood? Right, let's do it. Stand by. <laughs> Set mainsail full extension. Mainsail set. Set port sail full extension. Port sails set. Starboard full extension. Spinnaker full extension. Mari, wake up, please.
like an arthritic Algolian dung beetle than a tiger moth. Mari, you must be quicker with the spinnaker. We're going to repeat this maneuver over and over again until you can do it perfectly. Smoothly and swiftly and if necessary in your sleep. Is that clear? Engineer to Captain, we are being fired on by an unknown vessel. Are we hit? Uh, minor sail damage. I think it was a warning shot. I'm on my way. Stay here, all of you. Can you establish a comm link? The signal keeps breaking up. Ah! I can do. What the hell is that? Thanks, me. Who are you? What do you want? Why did you fire on us? We are sending a boarding party. Cooperate and you will not be harmed. Resist and you will be destroyed. Stand by for boarding. Very informative. What do we do? I'm going to retract the solar sails. Whatever happens, I'm not going to risk any more sail damage. I'll go down to the power room. Get on with checking the drive units. Might as well keep busy. Captain to crew. The vessel that fired on us is an unidentified battle cruiser. They've got us covered with a space cannon and they're sending a boarding party. That's all I can tell you because that's all I know. I'm going to retract the solar sails on automatic override from here. Stay where you are till further instructions. Captain, out. A message, Commander. The war wheel is proceeding to the next interception point. The Admiral wishes to remind the Commander of the supreme importance of this mission. The spy knows our final assault plan. He must be captured or killed. I'm going to deal with this matter myself. Will you coming? Order. 
now. Search proceeding. on my ship. I'm Lisa Duran, ship's captain, and I demand an explanation. Five targets down. This ship is now under Santaran control. Lieutenant Vaughan. The ship is secured, Commander. Six humans are listed on the ship's crew roll. Commander? There are five human bodies. One human is missing, Commander. Precisely. Robar, the ship's engineer. Find him, bring him to me alive. I shall go at once, Commander. No, Lieutenant, you shall send a trooper. Unlikely as it may seem, I may have need of you. Commander, where shall I send the trooper? To find an engineer? It's a wild guess, Lieutenant, but maybe you could start with the engine room. Yeah, you'll have a splitting head for a while. Oh. Take it easy. Oh. You seem all right. Experience. I've been stunned before. Why don't you go and revive the others? I'll only start mining. Uh. See? Mari? Mari, are you all right? What have they done to you? Um, oh, you're alive. She's alive. Of course she's bloody well alive. What happened? She was shot by a blaster set on stun. We all were. But why? Who are they? What do they want? I don't know. We must help her. Here. She'll have a dry mouth and a sore head for a while. Oh. Her too. Oh. Oh. Feeling better? Not much. What do you think this is? Piracy? Did you get a look at their ship? Briefly, on the scanner. 
Und die Lunge? Massive. Ah, didn't smack of piracy to me. It feels more like military. Well, I'm going to find out. Le <laughs> See? Robar isn't here. Where is he? Engine room, checking the power drive. Perhaps they won't find him. Oh, they'll find him all right. Get yourself killed. Let's humor them. Everybody stand up. I should like to protest at the brutal way in which you've treated us all. My father is president of Valeria, one of Earth's major colonies. And mine is the planet's leading industrialist. So when he. All of you! Or you will be shot! Move! Sometimes. You know our race. Only by reputation. Even primitives have heard of the might of a glorious Santaran Empire. I didn't say what reputation. I am Commander Steg of the Santaran Space Corps. Why did you shoot us? To establish discipline. You must understand that nothing Nothing and no one must stand in the way of my mission. Why does your mission involve taking over my space yacht? And you are? Lisa Duran, the captain of this ship. Forgive me, Captain. All you primitives look rather alike to me. What is the purpose of this vessel? Why is it equipped with solar sails? To race. Explain. At an arranged time, this ship and others of its kind set off to cross an agreed segment of space using only the power of solar sails. Why? The ship that makes the crossing in the shortest time is the winner. Potato Head. The solar sails are clumsy and inefficient. The crossing will be achieved far more quickly by use of the power drive. Well, that's not the point. Then what is? To race. To compete. What do you do on your planet to amuse yourselves, to test yourselves to the limit? Ah, you mean war. Search.
My task is a simple one. I seek out an enemy of my people. A Rutan. What do you know the Rutan is? What were they? Why are you so sure your enemy is on my ship? I am not sure. It is merely a possibility. One amongst many. Your last port of call was Space Station Alpha? We carried out our last refit there. We took on supplies, but that was some time ago. We tracked our enemy to Space Station Alpha. We arrived in pursuit, took over the station and searched it. Our enemy was no longer there. And Alpha is one of the busiest way stations in this particular star system. Precisely. In a period between our enemy's arrival and our own, many vessels arrived and left. And you intend to board and search every single one of them? Every. Single. One. But that's outrageous. According to all laws of the Tri-System Alliance- We Santarans do not concern ourselves with the laws of inferior species! But you have no right! We have the power that gives us all the right we need. So what happens now? My troopers are currently searching the ship. If we find our enemy, we shall attempt to capture him alive. If we do not succeed, then we shall kill him. Then we shall go. And if you do not find him? Then we shall search the ship again more thoroughly to make sure. Then we shall leave. So, whatever happens, my ship and my crew will be left unharmed? That is so. I have no interest in your survival. But I have no reason to harm you. Take care not to give me one. So, you have two species on your planet. She is a human female. A female. The hair is finer, and the thorax a different construction. Leave her alone! He is a human male. They are sexually pair bonded. Ah, interesting. She is female. Yet she is not afraid. You are male. Are you sexually pair bonded? No. Stay here. Cause no trouble. Are you functional? Yes, Lieutenant. Guard the airlock. Let no one pass. Commander. Report in the proper fashion. Lieutenant Vaughan reporting, Commander. Has the ship's engineer, Rovar, been found? No, Commander. Have the search patrols found any trace of our enemy? No, Commander. You do have something to report. There has been an attempt to leave the ship. The guard trooper was stunned. An attempt? By whom? By what appeared to be one of our troopers. But when I fired, it 
vanished into a blaze of light. Yes, Commander. Are you sure you hit it? Yes, Commander. Blaster on maximum? Yes, Commander. Excellent. So our enemy is wounded, and it is on board this ship. It will need power. Organize a thorough search of the power room. Rip the place to pieces if you have to. If the power drive is destroyed, the ship will be unable to proceed. Vaughn, this ship isn't going anywhere. Not any more. Lieutenant, this is where I found the body. But what makes you so sure? Stegg said himself he had no reason to harm us. But maybe it's not here. Oh, he'll blow up the ship. Then they're covered either way. What about all the other ships they'll be boarding? Same problem, same answer. They're that ruthless. Hmm. Look, I met this old boy once on Metabilis 3. He called himself the physician or the, the dentist or something. He seemed to know a lot about Sontarans. He said they live for war. Did value their own lives, reproduced by cloning. Is it war with the root and keeps them busy. Mm. So, what do we do? Kill Steg. Kill them all. Oh. The old boy said they've got one weakness. You! Come! what he said. Kurt wants to kill the Sontarans. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to me. Oh, you're a stupid fool, Nikos. Don't you see our only chance of survival is to cooperate with Commander Stig? Well, look how far resistance got you. Perhaps she's right. But of course I'm right! Stupid bitch! They'll kill us all! You go ahead with this mad plan and I shall warn Commander Stig. You'd betray him. You can play around with your own life if you like, but don't you dare endanger mine. Survival at all costs. If necessary, yes. What are you doing? Why are you interfering with the power drive? Interference was not of my doing. Our enemy is on board this ship. Your enemy? The Rutan wants two things. Access to a power source and escape. To attain this, it will kill every living being on this ship. Centauran, or human. Commander, we have found another obstruction in a power drive unit. Then remove it. No. You say the Rutan did this? Most certainly. It partially dissected the body to study its structure. It wasn't you or one of your troopers? Think, Captain. I could have killed your engineer. I could have killed you all the moment I came on board your ship. But why would I hide the body and bring you here to see it's discovered? Why would I kill one of my own troopers? You were sexually pair bonded with this man? We worked together for a, a long time. You have feelings for him. You want revenge? Yes. And help me seek out and destroy the Rutan. Well, what's in it for me, apart from the sheer satisfaction of it? What more do you require? A guarantee of safety for my ship, myself and my crew. You have it. And if we find this thing and kill it, you and your troopers will go and leave my ship and my crew unharmed? We shall. On your personal word of honor as a Sontaran officer? I give you my word. Well, I, I warn you, Commander, if you betray me, I shall do my best to kill you. Naturally. And I accept, but I can't speak for the rest of the crew. 
We'll have to ask them direct. I'm sure we can convince them. Shall I expel the bodies into space, Commander? Well, you can do what you want with your trooper. But I want Robar taken to his cabin and decently laid out. I'll have him shipped home to his planet. But he's dead! Dead bodies are without value! He's a human being, not a piece of garbage. Don't Sontarans respect their dead? We respect death itself. We respect death in battle. What remains is useless. However, do as she says. Let's go and talk to the rest of the crew. Do you really mean to spare her, Commander? I wish I could. She has the spirit of a Centauran. You gave your word. Promises made to inferior species have no validity. The honor of a Centauran officer lies in doing his duty. When the hunt is over and the Rutan destroyed, all the humans must die. Well, that's it. Steg promises us our freedom and safety if we help him destroy his enemy. He's already promised us that. And you didn't trust him. You do? He needs our help. We've got something to bargain with. Commander, these two are plotting to kill you. Is this true? Is this true? OK, OK. I did the plotting. I told the captain here that she had nothing to lose by attacking you. And what did you say? Well, I was considering it, but then you made your offer and I accepted. I'll keep my word if you keep yours. You wish to kill me? Seemed like a good idea. Well, do it. Do it now if you have the courage. Perhaps you can kill Vaughn too before he tries to kill you. Then you will have two blasters and only a few leaderless troopers to deal with. Well, why don't you shoot? I don't like the odds. But I do. There is a concealed safety catch in the butt of the gun. Touch it once and it will not fire. Touch it again, and it will. <laughs> In every group of prisoners, there is always one that is dangerous, one that must be killed. I did not think that it would be you. He at least had courage. He died a glorious death! You killed him! You bastard! You bastard! You killed him! Can this female be quieted, or must I kill her? Mover. We have wasted enough time. We must set to work to destroy the Rutan, even though our forces are now reduced. Well, you reduce them. take on the form of its victims. It feeds directly on electrical energy. If its power is low, it may simply reanimate a corpse, but at full strength, it can take on the shape of the entity it has destroyed, at least for a while. What are you saying? It can look like anyone? Like one of us? Only if it has destroyed the original. It has to kill to copy. But how do we tell if someone's a copy or not? 
If you encounter a Rutan disguised as one of you, you will know. How? It will kill you. But if we find one, disguised or not, what do we do? Retreat towards either the engine room or the airlock, drawing the Rutan with you. Oh, great. Live bait. Why those places? That's where our remaining forces are concentrated. We shall lie in ambush and destroy the Rutan. Commander! Message from the trooper sent to release the guard at the power room. He found two dead troopers. Nothing else. The creature has re-energized. We must double the guard upon the airlock. It will try and steal the assault craft and escape. The Rutan is at its strongest and most dangerous. We must find and destroy it without delay. Come. What about Mari? Leave her here. She's uh, safer here than we are. I'll lock the door. Lieutenant Vaughan will mount the guard on the power drive. I shall join the guard on the airlock. These are the two danger points. The Rutan needs two things, access to a power source and escape. The rest of you, search your assigned sectors. If we survive this, I'll deal with you later. Leave it! This way? Now this is where we're supposed to split up. Look, I can't take this anymore. You go on with this monster hunt if you like, but I'm going back to the crew room. I'll look after Mari. All right, but you'll need this. Great. So do we split up? Do we hell? You don't buy Steg's plan? About as much as you do. You're not going to hunt the root? Hunt it? We're going to help it. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna do it in style. Ooh, you don't look yourself, darling. You should be in bed. I said you should be in bed. There's somebody in the bed. Come and see.
did you do that? The dentist told me. Probic vent, weakness, screwdriver. It works. I'll bear that in mind. I'll go and close down the power drive. All patrols report in. All patrols report in. Report! You're not leaving us, are you, Steg? I leave now. You and the Rutan have defeated me between you. I leave you to each other. Ask me if I want to kill you. Would you kill someone who is quite unarmed? You did. But I am a Centauran. Humans have different values. Don't count on it. Surely you will allow a defeated enemy to depart in peace. <laughs> I was mistaken. It was you I should have killed. I salute you, Captain Duran. You were a worthy enemy. Is he dead? They're all dead. All the Sontarans and most of my crew. I take it that Mari and the real Zarel are dead as well. Death is inevitable in war. Do not try to harm me unless you wish to die also. I shouldn't dream of it. I could kill you both with ease, but we share a common enemy. I go now, in my enemy's ship, with secrets that will save my people, and in my natural form. I win. 
cringe burn. <sighs> Told you Steger blew up the ship. And he saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> Some shakedown cruise. A damaged ship. And a dead crew. This'll be the end of inter-system solar racing for me. Not necessarily. With a ship full of dead people to explain? You worry too much. Sure, there'll be an inquiry. But we'll come out of it heroes. <laughs> Maybe so. But I'm still out of the race. I'll never get a, a new owner's syndicate together in time. You're looking at one. What? The old syndicate was a tontine. What? We all agreed, if anyone got killed, we got their share. Sole survivor. Sole... Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> this could be the uh, beginning of a beautiful friendship. Mm. When we get back to Station Peter, we'll have a full refit. We'll hire a professional crew and we will sail the socks off every solar yacht in the galaxy. If only we could be ready in time. Well, get on to Station Beta, get things moving. This is Tiger Moth to Space Station Beta. Tiger Moth to Space Station Beta. But this is just a solar racing partnership. It doesn't mean to say we're sexually pair bonded, you know. This is Tiger Moth to Space Station Beta. This is Tiger Moth to Space Station Beta. This is Lisa Duran. They stop, they look, the music's very built up, and he raises his hat. I first thought about doing a Sontaran drama in about 1979. Kevin came to us and said he might have a project. I thought, well, let's, let's have a go and see if we can get the rights. Sontarans. 
had a phone call from a chap called Kevin Davis the other day. Raisins. <laughs> and mixed pill. So he said, could you be at my boat by the River Thames Saturday morning at 11 o'clock? And I said, yes. And then he said, do you remember Jan Chapel?" And I said, yes. He said, would you like to be pair bonded? And I thought to myself, pair bonded on Kevin's boat? Great idea. Paige, I think Brian should be quite sweaty throughout the whole film, actually. <laughs> Because Dreamwatch is aimed at telefantasy fans, we decided to cast from well-known science fiction series like Blake Seven and Doctor Who. I was delighted to be asked to do Shakedown. It sounded like it was going to be a lot of fun. Leave it, leave it, leave it. Just give me an eyeline, nothing. Just give me an eyeline. We're going from where? Well, it don't match up, does it? Seen God knows, God help us, take two. Trust her in... Oh, sorry. See, I'm with Brian's agent. And uh, she came on the phone and said, We've got this thing, it's a sort of Blake 70 thing, thingy, and I thought, great! <laughs> oh, I didn't have to pay me. Well, no, don't get that on tape, because Kevin will hear it. I just trying to see if we've got a bit of a shoulder on here. Kevin had very strong ideas about the kind of film he wanted to make, um, which was a 1970s style Doctor Who action adventure. A simple story, beginning, middle, and end, but using sort of 90s effects. When I came to write Shakedown, the, the basic premise was to bring back the Santarans. Yeah, where am I going? The story was that the Santarans are going to take over uh, a space yacht, uh, captained by a uh, female space captain, Lisa Duran, who's our kind of main lead character. The video is made on a very small budget with a very, very small uh, crew. There were times when myself and the other actors wondered whether we would actually complete it in the time allotted, which was uh, a fortnight. Right then, can we go for this, please? Can we be really behind? If you want to finish this film by the summer, you've got to speed up. It's very flattering to be asked to play um, anything without having to go through the uh, process of uh, readings or auditions or interviews. So when somebody actually asks you if you'll be in send you a script and asks you if you're interested in playing the role because they want you to uh, your desire is to say yes of course um, so I was very flattered when Kevin asked me and um, I liked Lisa I liked I like being in charge I stay here all of you <laughs> She's really, just really bright, intelligent, brilliant actress. Um, just everything we needed. And she's got that gritty edge to her that made her believable as Lisa Duran. She was the kind of mainstay of the whole thing, and I don't think that uh, that part could have been better done. You know, I mean, I think that's a character that could easily go on to make a series. In retrospect, I'm absolutely thrilled I did it. We had a lot of fun, and I was working with uh, dear Brian Croucher, who, of course, was in the series Blake Seven with me. So... Uh, uh, that was uh, especially nice to be working with him again. It doesn't mean to say we're sexually pair bonded. She, she said, you were so laid back. Is this portrayal of Kurt really how it was on the paper or did you make it up as you go, went along? I said, I said, darling, I went to one of the most prestigious drama schools in London. How dare you say that to me? Get in the kitchen and make me a cup of tea now. Not only did she do that, she came back with a couple of digestive biscuits to boot. She's under my thumb, I tell you. Serious. That's, how, that's typecast, you see, that's how I got the part of Kurt, you see, that's how I treat women. I like a digestive biscuit. Still running. You should try to go back. Okay. What? So you, if you, right. you, don't, don't do a little one, aim up straight at me. I play a very unusual character for me, which is partly why I agreed to do the script, because I play a character called Mari, who's a bit of a shrinking violet, 
which, um, as you probably know, is not quite my style. And I'm finding it quite difficult, actually, to play a, a sort of... meant to be rich and spoilt and um, I mean I just find that very very hard to play and the kids back home have raided their grandmother's wardrobes and made the name of Zarel fashionable again almost well look okay. at can we I want to get I want to get back here somehow well, I want to come back here yeah. so you could you could turn the character of Zarel was just as different as you could possibly get from Susan in Doctor Who Oh, she's a bitch, <laughs> totally self-motivated. She's not so much an alcoholic, uh, but she does like her booze. She does all sorts of things to the Sontarans that anybody in their right mind would not do, but perhaps she gets away with it because she's considered to be a bit loopy anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Why? The ship that makes the crossing in the shortest time is the winner. Potato head. The Santarans came about in a serial by Bob Holmes called The Time Warrior, and Bob came up with the whole character of the Santarans, who are this fiercely militaristic race who live for war um, and who um, reproduce by cloning, so they always have millions of warrior cadets at each hatching. And um, the, the whole character kind of was, was born out of that. What do you do on your planet to amuse yourselves, to test yourselves to the limit? Ah, you mean war. Commander Speg is the leader of the Centaurans. He uh, does most of the talking for the Centaurans and bosses everyone around. He's just a horrible guy who has a heart of gold in the end. But I don't want to give too much away, of course. Uh, he's um, he's all right, but he, he's no real interest in, in any of the humans, whether they stay alive or not. The Sontaran commander in this, who, although he is um, ruthless and will do his duty, has a sort of grim humour. And uh, also, you feel at the end, develops a certain amount of liking or at least respect for, for Lisa as, as a worthy enemy. And I saddled him, you know, given that the Sontarans have some kind of social hierarchy and they have nobility and whatever, I saddled him with a slightly dim lieutenant who tends to get things wrong. Oh, and uh, has to have everything explained to him very, very slowly. So one got a certain sort of uh, interplay between them as well. Do you really mean to spare her, Commander? I wish I could. She has the spirit of a Sontaran. You gave your word! Promises made to inferior species have no validity. The honor of a Centauran officer lies in doing his duty. When the hunt is over and the Rutan destroyed, all the humans must die. Uh, initially, I was cast as Command Stake Psychic, born. And uh, I don't know what happened, we just did a read through, and it, it sounded. It's born as a funnier character, he's sort of, he's like Igor. Yes, Commander. And, uh, he's supposed to be a bit of a dimwit and uh, a, a bit of a comedian. And I suppose people that know me say I can play that quite well without even knowing to uh, act. According to every law of the Tri-System Alliance... We Santarans do not... Oh, remember their lives. We Santarans... <laughs> the, the, the one good thing is kids bumped into a lot of children. Yeah. And it's absolutely great because they, you know, they think you're real, you know, and made a big thing about it when I come up, you know, just to, to make a bit of fun with them and ask them their names and they're great, they really are, you know, they make it for you, they make you feel good. Well, I can tell you what my son Sean, he's four, and he came up to me the other day and he said, those Sontarans are silly bastards, aren't they? Surely you will allow a defeated enemy to depart in peace. Attention all safety links. <laughs> well, Miss Atkinson, plus your own sister, please start to report to me. 
The sound recordist Lisa Newsom had a terrible time on the HMS Belfast because of all the sound problems there were. We had trips of uh, girl guides and boy scouts and we at least expect them just when we're about to sort of zap somebody or, or take over their, their spaceship you suddenly hear giggles of schoolboys or schoolgirls upstairs. Not from the deck up but from two decks up because it all comes down the metal shafts and you can hear people sort of talking from miles away and things like that. The stiletto heels are the thing because they hit the roof and they resound all the way down. Two levels they will go down and you can hear them. Now, I've been told, Marquez has assured me that he can wash most of them out. And there's the bloody toilets. That's the toilets, everybody. Douglas Trumbull, when he directed Silent Running, hired an aircraft carrier, which they used as the interior of the spaceship. And you can see all the bulkheads and the doors and the hatches and everything. And um, so I was out with, uh, with Mark Ayres, working on 30 Years in the TARDIS. As we were driving back over to our bridge, we said, oh, let's just stop and have a look around HMS Belfast. So we literally just parked up, bought our tickets and went on. And we got on board and we looked around and, and, and realised that we could, uh, we could make the programme there. Science fiction is expensive by definition. And there's a terrible problem, I mean, even in a low-budget commercial production, that you get this feeling of cardboard covered with silver paper, you know, and everything is slightly wobbly. Wonderful thing about the Belfast is that it's solid, you know, it's massive steel ladders and pipeways, and with a very little dressing, you know, a very little futuristic dressing, I think it made a very, um, a very convincing spaceship. Now this way. This the set is amazing. I mean, it's wonderful to have this ready-made iron construction which looks like the inside of a spaceship. It's great, perfect setting. The walls don't move. The walls don't move, no. I mean, it's all pretty, pretty solid. So you can sit down with quite a bang and nothing will move. One of the things I think that's great about acting is that you suddenly find yourself appearing in all sorts of situations that you would definitely not appear in and not be given the chance to appear in if it weren't for the fact that you were acting. It was all right whilst we were doing it in the warm uh, down down below decks, but when they took me up in a false nine gale, it numbed my brain, which was rather good because they had me up there climbing ladders and pulling ropes and looking over my shoulder, pretending not to see these pleasure boats going by. My character is called Nikos. He's the son of a, the main industrialist on this planet, whose name I've suddenly forgotten, but I believe it's called Valeria, of which Sophie's father is the president. We actually have to be quite close in it. We have to be fiancé to each other. And so that's quite funny, walking in two days ago and meeting this guy who I've suddenly got to be all lovey-dovey with. That's, that's funny as well. In a couple of the scenes, I'm wearing this fantastic dress which apparently was um, made by a woman who makes lampshades, usually. It's actually a friend of mine who... Um, the dress is based on lampshades that she makes. And uh, as part of her promo, she, she made a dress to look like her lampshades, which she calls knitted chandeliers. Helly is absolutely superb. This is the designer. She is absolutely tremendous. She's been beavering away non-stop making costumes while we're filming. And she's always smiling. And she's amazing. She's, she's just so adaptable. It's more the, the making of the stuff is more interesting for me. I like to have that complete look. It's really nice working with the masks and the, the more prop side of it, because I like the way they all go together. The Sontaran team was led by Derek Handley um, and David Miller with um, some input from uh, Susan Moore and Stephen Mansfield, who I brought in to, to lend a, a more professional eye to what David and Derek were doing. David and Derek hadn't really done anything to this scale before. We've made all the masks, the collars, the guns, 
The helmets. The helmets. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Like you really rang up at, at midnight and said, I need one for the next morning. Can you do it? <laughs> Underneath, to make it um, more animal like and big shoulders and slimmer hips and just bigger, we've got padding underneath. We've got a layer of taffeta and then a layer of wadding and a layer of cotton for comfort. And then underneath, we've got big shoulders. With lots and lots of padding and foam and all sorts covered with a bit of t-shirt to keep it all in place. Um, and then at the back we've got a rubber thing that we had from another production that was um, mus musculature shapes that fit in the back, goes across for the back muscles which is a good foundation to start from. Well, after about 10 minutes it gets very, very hot. And the interesting thing is after every take, uh, all the people who are very, very kind they run up to me with those automatic fans and undo a zip and just shove it down here and under here and try not to take the mask off but keep it as cool as possible. And it does a lot of good around here, but down here it's like a sauna and, and dripping. It, it can be very dangerous having these um, hot suits on. People have fainted on set in the past and uh, you have to be careful you get dehydrated very quickly. It was difficult to, to, uh, to be a millionaire in overalls, because I've never seen a millionaire wearing overalls. She's the best solar yacht captain in the dinner. Oh, f it. This is it. Is it and of course, Michael Wisher playing Robar, um, who was the first, and in my mind, the greatest Davros, um, the definitive Davros in Doctor Who, apart from all the other things that he's played. Just give us a moment more of the shake before you sit forward. Well, yeah. Michael was just supposed to stay for a day. He ended up staying for four because of the problems we were having with the schedule. And he was a real good sport about it as well. Press off. <laughs> I much prefer this kind of makeup than, than your average just straight makeup. But a lot of the makeup that's been in this hasn't sort of been really straight as such. So you can play about with things and, and invent things. It has been fairly easy. Um, there has been a few sort of technical hitches with the, with the mouths, uh, not sort of, you know, but I think we've sort of overcome that. I mean, basically, with them, it's just putting the eye makeup on around the eyes and things like that. I mean, it's a bit tricky because it, it, it's an area which is very sensitive as well, and they have, I have to keep going in and in and redoing it and powdering and powdering, and their eyes get quite sensitive after a while. The atmosphere on the set was really tense the first few days. I mean, there was serious worries because we went massively behind immediately. We just weren't ready. The average day would start, you know, with the drive into HMS Belfast. On the way, we would see Kevin in front of us, you know, he would appear. And we could see him in his car. Every time he pulled up to the traffic lights, you could see him scribbling notes, you know, obviously trying to work out what we were going to do during that day. I need to get you to that side. To do An average day's uh, shooting on um, Shakedown consisted of, with a bit of luck, being called about midday, um, with the knowledge that you would be working in all probability till 10. In fact, that's not midday. You'd be called for to be ready at midday. So you'd be called for makeup maybe half past 10, 11. And um, you'd hope that everything was ready on time. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. And uh, then we would uh, start shooting uh, round about midday. The lunch and tea breaks were, as we call them, on the run, which meant grab a sandwich if there's time. I don't think the cameraman uh, on this shoot uh, ate a sandwich in a fortnight. I never saw him eat any sandwiches uh, during the, the two weeks. The one-man band of David Hicks, who, I mean, do you, do you know those people who have multiple personalities? He played seven electricians, a focus puller, a cameraman, and a bit of a director. He had about eight personalities. David Hicks. The cast were just absolutely brilliant. To, to put up with that amount of chaos and those, that, that kind of schedule. It was absolute chaos. Again, because of lack of time, lack of time for preparation. The second week was so much more relaxed. Not relaxed, <laughs> just more organised. Before doing any of the effects, 
Ian tested out the explosives. And so everyone stood around and watched while he wired up a couple of bangs and showed us which one. He showed me the small one. Three, two, one. <laughs> wow, holy cow. I couldn't believe that was a small one. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he just tested out these effects and Three, bang, two, huge one. flash. Um, so he said, thank you very much, we'll have one of those, thank you. And uh, he rigged it all up. But we took it very seriously. When you're doing something like that, it's the only way to take it. Ian Schoons. I looked into his eyes and I trusted straight away. I said, are you married? He said, no, but I've got a nice dog. I said, you'll do for me. So I let him wind me up and it went boom. As I said, I'm very butch. <laughs> Exploded, there it was. I was a lucky man. Yeah, but we're doing the bit before I'm killing the trooper. I'm not killing Steph. That's right, that's right. We're doing the trooper first of all, not bomb the trooper yet. I mean, they all look the f***ing same. I'll kill them all now. All three of them. <laughs> Do three scenes in one. I've always enjoyed doing the action scenes in uh, Blake 7 and certainly in Shakedown because, really, I would quite like to have been in um, Westerns. Jan, start, start a lot closer. Yeah, you come in closer. Well, I can just in. walk through. I'm trying to say, shouldn't it be much more close? Yeah. A scene like, for instance, the airlock scene in Shakedown. Now, that was crucial timing-wise because Ian Schoons was uh, at the end of a wire holding one of the airlock doors, and I had to run past it. He had to then time letting it go. If he hadn't, of course, you know, Lisa Duran would not have been there to complete the rest of the video. During the scene with the airlock, I was actually behind the door giving it a hefty shove Lovely. and um, I got very worried because I hit Jan twice quite hard. Thankfully she didn't take it out on me, she took it out on Kevin. Okay, just the look of horror Jan before you attempt to squeeze All right. it. Alright! Action! That's it, you got it. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Look at horror, look at horror, what do you think I'm here for? Hello. Hi. <laughs> And there was one point where the, the airlock was, it was all lit like from above, from, from just below and various other lights. And we were all just about ready to go. And all the lights went out. And, What's going on? What's going on? And one of the like, makeup people had plugged in their hairdryer into my socket and blown all of my lights out. And I spent the next 15 minutes trying to work out who'd done it. And Tony with uh, Kevin Dunn just pulled together and somehow created this, this airlock out of the exhibition balls that were just standing around. And Tony made uh, a big swing door out of foam board and uh, sprayed it all out the right colours and paid enormous attention to detail for the big Sontaran airlock door that slid open, uh, hinged upwards. And, um, and he made it look just exactly like the one on uh, Dave Bryan's model. <laughs> This is the wall wheel, some time wall wheel, <laughs> nice design. The models were excellent, but uh, although we hired a special lens, it was hardly motion control. The money was running out by then. We spent uh, a very long day, I mean very nearly 24 hours non-stop at Pinewood Studios in Cliff Cully's um, studio. And, uh, and I was whacked out. I mean, before that I'd only had two hours sleep. Dave the cameraman was ill, he'd had a terrible streaming um, cold. Well, I remember saying at the time, Kev, this is my dream, shooting models at Pinewood. I ought to be enjoying this. I just want to go home. During the making of 30 Years in the TARDIS, I'd met Paul Venesis, um, who is an editor, works on the clothes show and various other things up at Pe BBC Pebble Mill. Paul did a fine job, technically very competent, um, and some stunning video effects. For instance, the Rutan, which, um, which is wonderful. It was a, a, a video effect, a circle, with a kind of billowing smoke blowing through it, which is how it was described in the script. The jellyfish thing only really appeared at the end, which was Tony Clark made a, a, plastic, um, a plastic jellyfish, basically. He sculpted this thing and took a vacuum form from it. And, um, uh, and we hung this jellyfish up in front of a blue screen. And then Paul Venesis took that added a video element to it, and we got this wonderful, ethereal, 
jellyfish, glowing, ghostly jellyfish shape going down the corridor. We have wasted enough time. We must set to work to destroy the router, even though our forces are now reduced. It's always a joy, actually, to sit down when you think the film is finished as far as you can take it, and then after a week or so's work, which is all it was, to sit down and see what Mark had done. I always say it's a humbling experience. To see this film, you know, come to life with a full-blown soundtrack. Destructor bomb, airlock, tunnel. I wanted to give it an orchestral score. I, I wanted it or, or a sound orchestral. Obviously, it was going to be done with synthesizers because we couldn't afford the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, but I wanted it to have a big orchestral sound. There are things in there which are taps, which, which are atmospheric, but but that is not the main function of the music. The atmosphere really comes out of the out of the dialogue and the characters in Shakedown. The music was just to push it forward and, and get you from A to B, and give it a dynamic. <laughs> Carol Ann Ford, when uh, refers to Vaughan as Potato Head and slaps him on the head, trying to get that sound was very difficult yeah. because obviously on set all she's doing is slapping a piece of latex rubber, which didn't quite sound right. It ought to be a, a slapping of flesh sound. So I actually smacked my own bottom. Potato Head. <laughs> but that's how that sound effect was created. And I've probably blushed terribly. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to see the film for the first time all the way through. The day before Dreamwatch 94, Kevin and Mark were there. They'd been working through the night on the sound dub. Look at that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Have you had a nice sleep? <laughs> I knew I was like having a nightmare about this bloody thing. Uh, I just sat watching them and it was quite an exhilarating experience seeing it all come together. Shakedown had dominated our lives for the last sort of uh, two and a half months and it was you know it's that funny sort of mixed feeling that you get I suppose it must be a bit like a parent when a teenager leaves home and it's like <laughs> sad it's all over but thank god they're gone I think it's astonishing in fact that it did get completed and I think that's thanks to a lot of goodwill and enthusiasm from uh, the people working on the project and supporters I think it compares very favorably with a lot of projects that have Oh, an enormous budget compared to the very, very small budget that we were working on. And uh, I was absolutely delighted when I saw the final product. Production, as I, as I keep saying, is always very difficult. I mean, just to get it finished, to have a film, you know, to have a one-hour film with that time and that money was a, huge, you know, was a huge achievement. Never mind about whether it was any good. Does it exist? Is it there? But to do a good film, and a film as good as that, I think was a, a huge achievement and reflects great credit on everybody because I think it is... I mean, it went down a bomb at the convention and they loved it. Great, terrific, wonderful. More like an arthritic... You're right about that line. Action. Okay, cut it. <laughs> Sorry. Cut it. The rutin is at its strongest and most powerful. We must bollocks. <laughs> oh s. Sorry, please. Go again, No, but you're dead! And you're so dead! I'm sorry. Why would I kill one of my own engineers? F troopers. Do, do that piece again. Okay, and action! <laughs> Probic vent. Weakness. <sighs> Screwdriver. It works. I'll bear that in mind. <sighs> close down the power drive. I'm going to close down the power drive. I only did one film with Kevin Davis. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing another one. You know, he's not a silly bastard of a Sontaran. He's a silly bastard of a director. But we all put up with him, because he smiles a lot. Right, let's look knackered. We 
<laughs> what do you mean, let's look knackered? <laughs> We've just this point at them. We've just right, it's, it's now a minute minutes. since we called cut on the last shot of Shakedown. It's Terence, Gary and Jason and myself just to say, hope you all enjoy it, really. Um, and everyone else wants to go home. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> This is Lisa Duran. Can you come in, please? Stop pissing about upstairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you here for Dave the cameraman. <laughs> well done, everybody. Well done, Dave. Well done. Well done. Well done. And I'm not doing it again.